Welcome to Rainier View. My name is Jeff. I'm part of the teaching team here, and we're excited to start a brand new series called What Matters Most? Because here's what we know. If you're catching this live in 2024, it is going to be a contentious and divisive year, just like 2023 was, just like 2022 was, just like 2021 was, and probably any year that you're catching this, watching this, no matter when, your year has some contention and some divisiveness in it. And so at the start of a year currently right now that is an election year, we wanted to, as a church, focus on what matters most for those of us who would say we are followers of Jesus. What does it mean to walk in the way of Jesus and what matters most to that? Because that is what discipleship is and it's all about. And because following in the way of Jesus, as people have done for 2,000 years, when following the way of Jesus got started, the question was, would Roman citizens continue to worship the emperor as God, or would they worship Jesus as their Lord? And so for Jesus, what was most important was not who was sitting on the throne as emperor in Rome. For Jesus, what was most important was who was ruling in the hearts and the minds of God's children. And that is still the same question that he poses to us today. Who are we ultimately trusting in in our lives? Who or what are we looking to for the sources of strength and hope and trust in our lives? And the same things that were posed to that first generation of followers of Jesus are the same issues and questions posted to us today. And what truly matters is what we want to talk about here. And so I want to talk today about the difference between being a person who is dogmatic versus being a person who is discerning around this topic of what matters most. And so I'll get into defining those things in a moment, but as with most things, telling a story will highlight what I mean best. And so for a good chunk of the 2010s, my, wife, uh, my family and I, we lived back East on the East Coast in Virginia. And so while we were there, I tried to squeeze in as much history as possible as we knew we weren't going to be back there forever. And so I'm a history lover, so much history uh, back there. But one of the places that I hadn't got crossed off my list yet as we knew we were going to be moving back to the West Coast. And so there was a place I hadn't got to and it was Monticello. Thomas Jefferson's home, and I knew I had to get to Monticello. And so I, I carved out some time on a Saturday to drive out there. And so I'm, I'm there and I'm taking part of the normal group tour. And so there's about 20 of us there and a tour guide is kind of walking us around. Now, uh, I believe Monticello does such a great job, the, the historical society there does such a great job of honoring both the positive aspects of Thomas Jefferson's legacy, like the dude wrote the Declaration of Independence, but they don't paper over or ignore the darker parts of his story and his legacy, namely owning and using upwards of 200 slaves at Monticello. And so they do a great job of not ignoring either, not not upvoting one or the other, but having them both side by side. I think it's a great way to tell history. But anyways, beside the point right now, I'm on this tour and the tour guide's kind of, you know, telling different things about Monticello. And then we get to a point in the tour where the tour guide is telling us about, you know, the family history that, that had been passed down from generation to generation around uh, Thomas Jefferson fathering children with Sally Hemings, one of the slaves at Monticello. Uh, but that coupled with DNA evidence, the timings of his trips that one historian looked at and uh, just... Yeah, all of these factors, uh, Sally Hemings being a biological half-sister to Martha Jefferson, Thomas's wife that died at a relatively young age. And so the tour guide is just saying, as we look at all these factors, uh, we can reasonably conclude that yes, Thomas Jefferson did indeed father children with Sally Hemings. Now at this point, there's a woman on the tour that goes, full dogmatic. She launches into her own tour, cuts him off mid-sentence, begins to lecture us all on how that could never possibly be true, that it, that it is completely false, and, and she's kind of meandering through these arguments. The tour guide, man, he is earning his money today, uh, and so he just, you know, very respectfully uh, asks her, well, I would be curious to know, where, where are you uh, deriving your information from? 
And the words that she utters will forever be etched into my memory as she says, oh, I know it's true because I read it on the internet. And the other 20 or so of us on the tour were kind of side-eyeing each other, like, don't laugh, what do we do? And the guy just so masterfully says, well, we'll have to agree to disagree. Let's head this way down to the kitchen where uh, ice cream was introduced first, probably in the United States, right here at Monticello. And we just go about the day, right? But that line, I read it on the internet, and that that drove in her mind, right, like the answer to everything. Uh, it highlights what we're talking about here. That for this woman, she was dogmatic. There was no possible way, regardless of any facts or evidence, that this could be possible that Thomas, Thomas Jefferson did this. And so uh, she was dogmatic in her position. Uh, and so that's what I mean by dogmatic. When we hold to things, our preconceived ideas, notions, biases, thoughts on things, divorced from facts, unwilling to look at anything, uh, and so that's what we're focusing on. We want to be a people who, who move from being dogmatic to being discerning. We weigh, we consider the sources, we know, uh, we know our own preconceived ideas going in, but we're open-handed in how we derive truth and how we understand what is true from what is false. And so let me give you a couple definitions to help with this before we go any further. When I say dogmatic, the good old Merriam-Webster's dictionary uh, defines dogmatic this way, and it could be helpful for you. Being dogmatic implies being unduly and offensively positive in laying down principles and expressing opinions. This is what being dogmatic is. And what I mean by being discerning is that out of all of the facts, opinions, and wisdom, and information that is coming at us constantly, we learn to sift through all that to understand what is not only right from wrong, true from false, but what is good, and good for us and what is not so good for us. What is, what is good, but what is truly best. I love what uh, I came across a quote by Sinclair Ferguson describing it this way and just really encapsulates why we have to move from an often simplistic view of life and faith to be people who are truly discerning. He writes this, most of us doubtless want to distance ourselves from what might be regarded as the lunatic fringe of contemporary Christianity. We are on our guard against being led astray by false teachers, but there is more to discernment than this. True discernment means not only distinguishing right from the wrong, it means distinguishing the primary from the secondary, the essential from the indifferent, the permanent from the transient, and yes, it means distinguishing between the good and the better, and even between the better and the best. And so if we are trying to be people who are following in the way of Jesus, discovering the freedom and new life that comes from that, then we have to be a people who pursue truth in its entirety, not in part, not in the things that confirm the way I already view the world, but pursuing it wholeheartedly, but to be committed to discerning the truth, even when it's inconvenient for us, even when it may challenge some of our assumptions and preconceived notions. And so here's the difference right off the bat that we need to understand between the two. And, and what does it look like? How do we know it shows up? Here it is. Being dogmatic leads to dividing, while being discerning leads to dialogue. When we're dogmatic, it leads to more division. When we're discerning, it leads to more dialogue, not just with the people that we already agree with, but the people whom we have disagreements with. That's what discernment looks like and how it shows up. Now, there's a problem here with discernment. Discerning what is true versus uh, what is false. We have the challenge, as I mentioned so far, uh, my, my preconceived notions come into the picture, right? And God gave us minds that work this way on purpose. Like the, the, the human mind is such a beautiful aspect of God's creation. I believe it affirms uh, that there truly is a God. It's, it's so remarkable how our human minds works, work. One of the ways it works is that the, our, our human mind performs snap judgments based upon preconceived uh, encounters and ideas and biases from before so that we can make quick and efficient decisions 
in a world where stimuli is coming at us constantly, right? And this is super helpful as human beings, right? When you go into the grocery store and you stand before a shelf of 145 different bags of chips, right? Your, your mind gives you some cues to say, I know what you really want. It's those chili cheese Fritos. Grab those bad boys. If it's been a while since you've had a bag, let me tell you, they're still great, right? And so it's extremely helpful when our minds do this. Uh, it allows us to act upon our preconceived uh, notions and ideas. When it becomes not so helpful is when we rely on that to navigate a contentious political season in relationships with other people. Those snap judgments all of a sudden don't serve us so well as human beings. And so being people of truth, if we say we're committed to being people of truth, we must always be willing to overcome some of those confirmation biases in place of what is actually true and what is not. Because things are played to our preferences, right? Things can be skewed so easily uh, and so the problem is that it's becoming increasingly difficult to discern true from skew or true from false, okay? For example, maybe you've heard of deep fakes. Maybe you've seen Photoshopped, you know, photos and they, they do a really good job of making it look like something happened in real life, or, but it didn't really. But to feel the weight of the challenge in the days ahead of us, I want us to watch this video of not Morgan Freeman, okay? Watch this video of not Morgan Freeman. I am not Morgan Freeman, and what you see is not real. Well, at least in contemporary terms, it is not. What if I were to tell you that I am not even a human being? Would you believe me? What is your perception of reality? Is it the ability to capture, process, and make sense of the information our senses receive? If you can see, hear, taste, or smell something, does that make it real? Or is it simply the ability to feel? I would like to welcome you to the era of synthetic reality. Now, what do you see? I share that with you, not to cause panic, not to cause alarm. If you were raised in the 90s and you're like, Terminator 2, Skynet, it is here. Let's do something, right? I don't share that video to, to you know, get you hyped up. But to highlight the challenges that we're going to have, we cannot just say, well, I just saw it on the internet, right? We cannot necessarily, again, just uh, on the surface, believe everything that we're seeing or reading because, in part, we no longer live in a postmodern era. We actually live in a post-truth era. Postmodernism, I get to just decide whatever truth I want is true, to a post-truth era, meaning I'm not certain how we understand what anything, uh, how anything can be true, and it just feels like there's nothing that is certain. There's nothing that is firm. Okay? And so we haven't really fully considered the ramifications of life and faith in a post-truth world. But let me give us some good news. Because when it's hard to know if anything is true, the good news is that openness to faith rises. And we can know that because of great solid research that's done. Okay? The, we would say biblically, the harvest is ripe. Look at some recent uh, research from the Barna Group on this. Okay, they recently, just last year, discovered that 74% of people polled in a recent survey would like to grow spiritually. It is three out of four people in the United States saying, yep, I would love to grow spiritually. And look at the, this other stat. 44% of them say, I am more open than I was before the pandemic. That's nearly one out of every two people is saying, I want to grow, and I am much more open to it than I was before the pandemic, okay? And so that's good news. There's space to talk about following the way of Jesus. There's an openness to it that wasn't as big, as big of an opportunity as it prior was. That's good news. The second piece of good news is that facing a post-truth world is nothing new, and Jesus himself 
faced it. Think, with, uh, think about the trial that he faces as he stands before Pontius Pilate. Would you read with me out of uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 18, picking up in verse 36? We read there, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. <laughs> what is truth? Pilate retorted. Jesus encountered this post-truth worldview in his day and age. And so we have a model of how to navigate it in our own lives. And so what does it mean to be uh, a people of truth in a world that is so incredibly challenged to even know what's up from down, what's right from left, what's right from wrong? And again, part of that challenge is once things you didn't have to consider, you didn't have to discern whether or not they were true or false, uh, today we have to do that on an almost daily basis to think critically about what is being presented to us. But again, let me give you some good news. This also is nothing new, okay? Consider one of the most well-known images from the revolutionary, revolutionary era of U.S. history. Uh, the, this, uh, it's really an engraving of the Boston Massacre. Um, so this engraving is attributed to Paul Revere. He actually lifted it off another guy. He was the one who made it popular. So plagiarism, it's been a thing for a while. But anyways, uh, Paul Revere has this picture. But I want to talk about, it's such a great example of learning discernment. We're going to talk about the discrepancies between what this image presents and what actually happens. Okay? Because look at the, just look at the picture. These poor, peace-minded Bostonians just out on a leisurely Saturday stroll with their dogs, doing nothing wrong, and just here come these British redcoats, and they just kill them in cold blood for no reason, right? It's kind of the picture presented uh, here in this Boston Massacre image of what happened in the 1770s. Now, uh, the reality, the facts behind that situation was actually, it was at night, there was a bunch of drunken Bostonians in a tavern, and they decided to start throwing chunks of ice and snowballs, and there had to be a rotten cabbage in there somewhere, at a lone British redcoat soldier. That guy goes, he gets back up, there's, a, there's several redcoats now, the, the group grows in the tavern, and they begin to push back, they throw things, more ice snowballs, you know, whatever they can find, and they're pushing the Redcoats back towards a government, uh, a government warehouse, storage facility. And so the, the Redcoats believe, okay, like a riot is about to break out. Somebody yells the word fire at some point. A shot is fired, multiple shots are fired, and multiple colonists are left dead. Now, you may be familiar with that. What you're likely not as familiar with is that future President John Adams decides to discern the facts of what happens, and he goes on to successfully defend these British soldiers uh, for, um, again, uh, the right of self-defense, and he successfully wins their case, okay? Now, we're not saying, by looking at all of this, that the revolution shouldn't have happened, or the British, you know, the British were in the right uh, in the way they were treating the colonists and taxation without representation, representation and all that. That's not what we're saying. What I am saying is notice, even hundreds of years ago, that Paul Revere and Sam Adams and the Sons of Liberty were really good at shaping perception using media and slanting it in a certain way to stir up the sentiment that they wanted to. But John Adams models for us a model of discernment, of weighing the facts, doing the right thing, uh, even when it seems to go against the grain. Uh, but again, that's a very important skill. It's always been required, but it's going to be more required of us now. And I think John Adams gives us this great example of not just catering, not giving, getting swept up in our confirmation bias, right? At the time, it would be easy to just believe, ah, those British redcoats, what a bunch of colonizing trash. Who cares if a few of them get strung up for killing some of our own, right? It would be a very common sentiment in the colonies. Instead, 
John Adams reminds us that we should look at the facts themselves to derive how we ought to, how we ought to move forward and address the situation of what happens. John Adams, by the way, one of the true uh, followers of Jesus in the Founding Fathers set, models for us what it looks like to not just be dogmatic, but to be discerning uh, when, we're, when we're trying to figure out what is happening in a given situation. And so I share all that to say there are two simple skills that all of us need to possess and sharpen when it comes to discernment. And so the first one is this, sharpen our discernment skills. The first tool is to move beyond this type of thinking. My group is always right, their group is always wrong. It is discernment skill number one. We cannot think my group is always right, their group is always wrong. We have to avoid that thinking, right? Because in, again, 1770s, all red coats are fill in the blank. All British Tories are fill in the blank. All colonists are fill in the blank, right? It, and we just, again, we move through history, you just change the labels, but we do the same thing. We, we often vilify one group and say there's nothing wrong uh, with, with our own groups, okay? And instead of, again, moving beyond the headlines, looking at the facts of a situation underneath something. Second discernment skill, kind of discernment 101, is this. Consider the source. Consider the source of what you're looking at. Is this source an opinion? Is it based upon some sort of factual research or reporting? Is it just false or distorted in some way, okay? For example, I cited some research uh, based upon people's spiritual openness earlier, but how do you know I didn't just make up those statistics, right? Well, again, if you go back, you look at that slide, you can see the, the research methodology notes even at the bottom of that slide. There's a proper way to go about conducting statistical research. It is so easy to present statistics as facts when so often there's no actual guidelines behind it. You know, I asked three people and they all agreed with me. And so this is truth, right? That's not good factual based research. I shared research by a reputable company who does it the right way each and every time. But often we base our thoughts, our, our, our conceptions, our preconceptions, and our um, biases are often informed upon things that aren't actually factual inputs into our lives, there are, or sometimes they're distortions of that input, right? It's easy to laugh at the lady on the Monticello tour who claim, her big claim is, I read it on the internet, right? But think about it, for me, I will claim this, how many times I've just seen a headline, how many times you've just seen a headline and you haven't even clicked on it, but then you're having a conversation. Oh yeah, I saw, I saw this article that said dot, 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 right? But you haven't even read the article. You haven't even looked at the facts, what they're presenting. Uh, you haven't even looked at their, their argumentation. Our mindset, our thoughts so often are being informed by merely a headline to an article that we haven't even bothered click, clicking on yet. Okay? And so we have to be discerning people uh, and thinking more deeply about it. And so what does it mean for us to be a people who value truth so much that we choose to do the hard work day in, day out, week in, week out of choosing to be discerning over choosing to be dogmatic? And it begins with being reminded that God is a God who desires us to be a people marked by truthfulness. By a, by a sober-minded pursuit of what is true over what conveniently confirms the ideas that I already have. Because part of the core calling of following of the way of Jesus is to love God with all of our mind, Jesus tells us. And so we have to do that well. You know, when God wanted his people under Moses' leadership to be distinct from the nations, from the various people groups around him, uh, he issued what seems common sense to us in the Ten Commandments, but often, both in Moses' day and our day as well, uh, can sometimes seem counterintuitive, okay? But think about this. What was Moses told? Hey, write this down. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Even from the very beginning, God's people were to be people marked by truth. Look with me in, in the book of Proverbs, which is all about wisdom. Hey, what is core to living wisely as a person? Here's just a, one sample from Proverbs 12. 
An honest witness tells the truth, but a false witness tells lies. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue only lasts for a moment. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. And then just one example from the New Testament. There are so many other places that speak to our need to be people marked by truth. But look with me, Ephesians 4, verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. And so even in a quick survey of what the Bible has to say about people who speak the truth, it's inescapable that God values us to be people who choose to speak the truth, pursue the truth, even above our preconceived ideas coming in to a debate, a discussion, uh, with, or just an, an encounter with other people who might disagree with us. And truth is never meant to just be some abstract discussion, but something that we embody and live out in our daily lives and in our interactions. And we do so because that's what Jesus modeled to us. That is the pattern that you and I are called to follow. And the proof of being, a, being people who pursue discernment over being people who are dogmatic is proved in our relationships. Once again, we know we are being dogmatic when it leads to further and further division between us and other people. We know we are being a person who is choosing discernment when it leads to increased dialogue, not just with people who are exactly like us and agree like with everything with what we believe, but we have dialogue ongoing with people who disagree with us in some way, shape, or form. And so the difference that Christianity ought to make in part in the world is to provide an objective standard of truth to live by, something solid to base our life and our decisions around. But that truth was never meant to just be a dry collection of dusty creeds. It was never meant to just simply live on an FAQ section on a website. No, truth was intended to be put on full display in the person and the work of Jesus so that everyone could see what truth looked like lived out. And the good news is that we can still see it today as we learn to walk in the way of Jesus. As the people of God remain faithful to being empowered by God's Spirit, living in the, in the very footsteps in the ways of Jesus to the world around us today, to the extent that the church carries itself that way, which by I mean the people of God, we can see the truth embodied and lived out. In, in a post-truth world, the most trustworthy truth that we can uh, trust in is a person, not a political party, not a platform, but a person. And if our trust is in the purpose, or in, the per, in the person of Jesus, then we have a trustworthy path to follow. The people have been following for millennia. And if we're trusting in the person of Jesus to orient us to what is true, then something kind of counterintuitive happens. We can become, as followers of Jesus, the most open people in the world to, uh, to the other people that God brings into our lives. Okay? We can sit across the table from people with all sorts of divergent beliefs from us and not be threatened, not chase them off, not tell them, get away from me. No, we can, we can sit with an with a openness to receive them. We can stand face to face with even falsehoods and accusations and not respond with anger because we know that God stands with us, because we know what truth really is, because we've come to know the person of Jesus in our life. Because we know if we simply treat others the way that Jesus has treated us, we can interact with people from different faiths, different backgrounds, different spaces, and create space to be with us and among us. Uh, and so when we do that, when we learn to live that way, when we learn to choose discernment over being dogmatic, here's the thing. We no longer need to vilify or condemn those other groups that aren't like us. Why? We can simply say, you know what, like what you're sharing with me it doesn't ring true to me. It doesn't line up as true to me because it doesn't align with the way that Jesus is inviting me to live my life. Can I share like the way that Jesus is inviting me to live my life and how it's a, it might be a little bit different, right? That's so different. Now, what it means is that we don't give a, here's what you shouldn't do to be a discerning person. You don't give a pass to the people who look like you, vote like you, and just are aligned with you all the way. You don't give that group of people a pass 
when they, when they aren't walking in the way of Jesus, when they're out of alignment, right, with, with ethics in the way of life that comes from following in the way of Jesus, while condemning groups of people whom you disagree with when they are out of alignment with ethics in the way of Jesus, right? There's an even-handedness to the way that we bring the truth of Jesus equally to the people around us. And so, uh, let me give you a very specific example, okay? Uh, you likely have people in your life with whom you disagree about the best way to go about addressing immigration in the United States uh, right here, right now, okay? But what is going to be true about the follower, a follower of Jesus, no matter what? What's true for the follower of Jesus is that we view each and every person as somebody who's created in the image of God, and therefore they have a dignity and worth regardless of their status and their position in life. And also, I don't have time to go there in this message, but God's word repeatedly again and again and again tells us to care for, sometimes it refers to the foreigner among us, right? And so if we're, if we're listening to God's word, we have to care about those who've immigrated here. That's an example of what matters most. And so being followers of Jesus, we must then reject any language that dehumanizes uh, or mischaracterizes other human beings whom God believes and calls his own children. Even, even while we might disagree about the best way for the government to not only extend dignity and care to those who might be fleeing from extreme violence or extreme poverty, but also how the government can care for the, the economic and social well-being of the entire nation. We can disagree around the ways that the government should step into this. But what should be clear for the follower of Jesus is their personal view and the way they, they talk about and treat those who are different than them coming here, okay? And here's, here's a little bit of, uh, kind of a little bit of a get out of jail free card on, on a lot of these discussions. You cannot be a geopolitical master of everything happening in the world around you, okay? It is completely okay if somebody is engaging you in a dialogue around any number of hot button issues to say, you know what, like, I haven't had the time to do the full work to un really understand this issue uh, in a way that I would like to. But you know, I do understand how Jesus wants me to view and treat other people, right? No matter what the issue is, you can bring it back to what matters most rather than trying to be some sort of policy expert or putting all your hope in what party might say this or that or what party might be occupying this or that office. Instead, our, what matters most is, again, responding as a person who's following the way of Jesus, viewing the people around us the way that God does. And there, here's the beauty in that. In a post-truth world, Jesus is the anchor of how I view others and, and interact with others, is like a beacon that cuts through the seemingly endless fog of ambiguity and half-truths that we constantly have to navigate in our world today. Because any other person or party or platform at some point will fail you. At some point will let you down. Or at best, it only sheds light on one aspect of what it means to honor God and be humans and understand even who we are and why we exist. Any other, uh, again, worldview, party, platform is going to fall short of the way that following the way of Jesus can help us navigate those questions. And so if you're following Jesus, then being open, having an openness to what is true, doesn't lead you to compromise your faith if you're mature. No, instead, it should allow you a curiosity to interact with those who are spiritually curious, okay? In fact, the marker of spiritual maturity is not being surrounded by super saints and only just people like you. I'm going to challenge some of you. That's actually a marker of immaturity, and here's why. If it was the marker of maturity to just be around, like, you know, uh, Christians who just again, think the exact same way like us on every single thing, then if so, Jesus failed at spiritual maturity, right? Just read any of the Gospels once and see the kind of company that's around Jesus, the kind of people he interacts with. He was constantly surrounded by people with all sorts of different ideas and opinions and worldviews and backgrounds, right? And so spiritual maturity looks like having spiritually curious people around us, spiritually maturing people around us, and we have 
dialogue and discussions rather than attack them with dogma, okay? If we just have a church full of people who come with their 28-pound study Bibles every Sunday and that's the only people around us, we would know we have failed. But I'm so grateful that we work so hard at creating spaces for people to be with us who are coming from all different places spiritually. They're in all different points of their spiritual journey. But we get to create a church environment where they can explore what it means to follow Jesus, that they can understand clearly what the good news, the gospel is, and have on-ramps to choose that in their own life, to process what's in the way of that and embrace it when they're ready. And so there is so much I wish uh, I had more time to get into, but I don't. But where to start? Where can you start choosing being a person who is discerning over a person who is being dogmatic? Well, it begins with prayer. I would encourage you for the, for the next month or so, would you daily pray for one person to have one relational open door to invite them to join you at Easter or to invite, uh, invite them to join you at the next best invite opportunity uh, at, at our church or your church if you're not joining us here? Would you uh, pray daily for a relational open door to invite them to that? Because here's what I know. Your perfectly crafted Facebook message is not going to change the minds of your friends, your family members, and your coworkers. But what I do know is that our God can. Our God can. And so that begins with you before you utter a word out of your mouth. Would you choose to pray for that relational open door? Because we believe and worship a personal God. And capital T truth comes when we learn to introduce people, not just to cold principles, but to a living personal God that wants a relationship with us. And that starts with prayer. And so would you leave here being a person choosing discernment over being dogmatic and praying for somebody to encounter the goodness of God and love this Easter. I'm going to lead you through right now exactly what I mean by this and how to do it. It's so simple, but you could just join me by praying just like this, even right now. Dear God, I pray right now for an opportunity to invite, put that person's, share that person's name between you and God right now. God, give me the eyes to see and the ears to hear the opportunities to extend a non-judgmental and warm invitation for them to join me this Easter or to join me at the next best invite opportunity at my church. Jesus, don't let me miss it. Amen. So grateful for you giving some of your time to join us here uh, in, our, in our series as we began in What Matters Most. And we really hope that you come back, uh, join us as we continue to look at these things because so much is at stake for getting it right this year. Let's get it right together by understanding truly what matters most.